Welcome to Fifa for Island, the podcast. I'm your host, Chris Madden, and today we have a very special guest on our pod, the creator of the video game Fifa for Island, my father, Toby Madden. Welcome, Toby Madden. Thanks, Christopher. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good now. It's a Friday. Happy Friday, everybody out there. If you're listening on a Friday, if you're not listening on a Friday, oh, well, hopefully it's not Monday for you. (laughs) Great. Well, we have a lot to talk about. And why don't we get right into where this all started? Can you summarize back in, what was it, December 2020? Or do you want to go earlier than that? Why don't we go way back? Back to the eight, 1980s, not the 1880s, 1980s. 1980s, oh my God, okay. Yes, where there was a thing invented called a personal computer. No, that's way back, too far, sorry. Getting boring on you. So anyway, it started way back in the late 1980s when I was playing some video games on the personal computers, and I was blown away what I learned by playing them. I took a whole year's class in college on the history of science and technology. And I learned more than that, more from playing the game called Civilization than I did in a whole year's course at the University of Minnesota. So that just sparked this huge interest in me to say, well, wait a minute, if I can learn by playing a fun, addictive game more than I can learn in a college classroom, (laughs) <laughs> There's got to be something here. Why isn't there more? And then I looked into it and I found that anything that was online or remote or distance learning or whatever was just basically a videotape of the instructor with chalk and talk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's been a long time coming. And actually in the early 90s, I decided I was going to make a difference and become an economist with the goal in mind to to revolutionize education technology so that people could just get information dumped into their heads, just poured into their heads and they enjoy it and they're really grooving on it and they can learn a lot in a short amount of time in a fun atmosphere out of their own living room. Great, and so that was in the 1990s. And so uh, two decades later, you finally are putting your dream into practice? Yes. And so over the decades, I was doing research in instruction and curriculum, taking courses in instruction and curriculum, taking courses in economics, becoming an economist, playing lots of different games and finding out what I liked about the games. Any game I play out afterwards, I would reflect and say, what did I learn from this game? Is it worth it for me to continue playing this game? Because have I learned everything that the game has to teach me? Uh, what games to avoid, that type of thing. So uh, it was decades in the making. A few years back, I was on my Steam account and they had this big sale on RPG Maker. Mm -hmm. And RPG Maker is a software engine that develops games. And I bought that. And somebody that doesn't have a lot of coding experience like myself, I could actually develop a game there. And so I had a proof of concept about three or four years ago because I could actually build a game in RPG Maker um, that taught economics, but it was very rudimentary. It didn't look that good. It wasn't that interesting of a game, but I still kind of had that out there. And then what happened was I checked on Steam and I found another interesting game and I jumped on that game and just kept on going, And but still had the RPG Maker in my inventory of Steam. But the stars kind of aligned last year with the devastating COVID crisis. Yeah, well, it brought me back home to to Minnesota. uh, And we started, we were cooped up in the same house together. Um, Yeah, well, it was very (laughs) enjoyable to be cooped up together because when you're gone for years at a time like you were, it was very, very, very enjoyable to have you live with us. Um, For those just tuning in, uh, my career has mostly been a ESL teacher in different countries. I've lived in France. South Korea and China teaching English and Thailand and Thailand, uh, a a range of students. Uh, But the pandemic, we were in China when the pandemic broke, my wife and I, we moved back to the U.S. We didn't know what we were going to be doing and ended up uh, applying for a green card for my wife and had the opportunity to work on this project with my dad. 
And when we started developing it, I'll let my dad continue for a second, but I just want to get the, the name Fififer Island comes from an imaginary island I created when I was 10 years old. Uh, apparently, I couldn't say my name very well. I had a speech impediment, so I'd be like Fififer instead of Christopher. <laughs> and so that became my uh, imaginary island. I drew a bunch of monsters, and they all, all had strengths and weaknesses, kind of like a Pokemon thing. And there was maps. I loved maps. And... I have, for a good year or two, I, I carried around this folder with all this, this creation um, showing off uh, to classmates and stuff. And it was a lot of fun. So I, I, I've i kind of used uh, creating an imaginary island in my lesson planning before. And so I'm really excited to, that we, we use this as a base of inspiration for the game that uh, we've created. So do you still have that hard copy around? From way back when? So I have six of the hard copies preserved in plastic slips uh, in my important documents. The rest of it was lost in water damage, uh, basement flooding, unfortunately. But I do have an electronic, I was, I thought ahead and I scanned every page. So I do have all the scanned electronic copies of the 50 some pages I made, thankfully. Yeah, that's wonderful. So yeah, th that's a great start because that's what really got you excited about the world and world possibilities and creating your own world. Um, so that's kind of a good start for a premise of a game, right? Fiffer for Island? Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of lore uh, revealed in this current game that we have, but in future games as well. Uh, so we're, we're excited for the, the, the future of the company. Why don't we turn back to the, the product that we have, the, the game Fiffer for Island, Trina's Adventure, it's available now on Steam. We just had our Steam release this week. Uh, it's been good. We've had good reviews, uh, but we're still trying to just get the word out there. And there's endless amounts of networking and marketing and, hey, check out this game. And we're really trying to get educators and teachers and parents, um, as well as middle school, high school students to you know, look into our game and see that, oh, it looks fun and I might, I'll learn something, you know, financial literacy, business, econ 101. It's a good combo. Yes. A lot of thought and hard work has gone into this project. Yeah. It took longer than I anticipated. We did a pretty good job, I think, early on last December and January of doing research before we even started. Uh, research on gamer types and what makes a good game, what doesn't make a good game, what are the, uh, how do people get into a routine playing game, some people call that game addiction, uh, what makes the storylines good, etc. What we found is that there are probably six or seven different styles of gamers, there might be mixed between them. One is the shooter games, and this is not a shooter game, so we just kind of went right into it saying, we're not making this for shooter type players. So if you're really into shooting things really fast and, and that type of thing, it's probably not the game for you, but we blended the mix of the other five or six categories of gamers. Uh, one type of gamer loves storylines and following through the storylines and being captured by the, enraptured by the, the storyline. Mm -hmm. Another type of gamer likes to explore and check out different things and, and go around and discover new things. And there's lots of that in the game too. Yeah, lots of exploration. Another type of gamer likes to level up and get achievements and move forward and that type of thing. And we have that too as well. And it really fits well with that type of gamer. Another type of gamer likes to build things, likes to have start out with nothing and then end up with a lot and have it really cool what you've built. This game is appeals to those type of players too. Other types of gamers like to have um, resource gathering where they can resource something and then they craft stuff with that resource and then they can use that to progress further in the game. And so it's got that as well. So from a gamer type perspective, it's, uh, I think, covered, checks a lot of the different types of gamers out there and the mix of gamers out there. You know, one gamer isn't strictly a shooter game uh, player. They like to advance in, in the game as well, et cetera. So there's a mix of that. That's one type of uh, research in terms of game gamers that we did. The other type was we looked into what gets a bad rap and probably rightly so is the addiction part of it where you get your endorphins from and how you repeat those and it's kind of like a, a slot machine the hooks the hooks yes the hooks like bring people in and to continue to play and continue to play 
the Skinner boxes and all the different techniques that gamers or game development companies use to get their players hooked on the game. Now we looked at those and we just use them sparingly in terms of we want them to get excited about the game and get endorphins and get joy out of the game. Um, but why they do that, they're learning economics. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of built for a good research loop or a good kind of loop so that you're learning more and you're getting better and better and better. Yeah, good feedback loop. We, uh, the core mechanic of the game, I believe, is the expansive tech tree of these different economic concepts that you learn through the game. And this was one of the first things you built and worked hard on with your the master educators that we consulted with, econ high school teachers, of how to teach these. We have 38 concepts, 38 tech trees, tech stones that the player has to unlock as they progress through the game, starting with needs and wants, what's an incentive, um, resources, labor, things like that. And it's taught in a somewhat of in a school fashion where there's a well first of all there's a visual diagram that pops up showing what how the concept works and then a written explanation of it and we have the audio voiceovers to help assist with the reading and then there is a multiple choice quizzer that comes up and then we've turned it into like a battle mode uh, where you have to get the answer correct to beat the mind master and progress in the game and unlock that tech uh that tech stone on your tech tree in, and for me, I love these types of branching tech trees going back to like civiliz civilization, you know, trying to unlock new technologies to do cooler things. And we have that in this game. And I think it'd be a really fun for uh, anybody to, you know, want to unlock all of these. Yes. And the tech tree is just a portion of it. We have quests that help with the tech tree. So it's like you have a quest to experience the concept. Yeah, for each then, of the sure for each of the tech stones, we want to incorporate what they're learning into the gameplay itself, and that's been the challenge for us and like what we've wanted to achieve with this game. And for many of these techs, I believe we've accomplished that. Uh, if you'd like to give an example, well, one example is barter. For example, barter is exchanging goods or services without currency, without money involved, and we have a whole area of barter where you're on a quest and you've got to get this item, then you got to get this item, then you got to get this item. And you, and you can't just buy those items with money you, or gold. You got to actually obtain those items from somebody else. And I'm going to get a little geeky on you here. It's the double coincidence of wants. Money makes it so great because I might not want what you have to sell, but uh, I can still exchange money because everybody wants money because with money, you'll be able to get what you want with the money. With barter, it's pretty inefficient because you got to keep on searching around to find out who wants to trade what you have with what they have. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one example of an experiential yeah. learning. And I think that the quest system, the experiential learning, where you're actually learning through the, uh, the gameplay, as well as the tech tree is kind of the revolution that we needed to make it fun and interesting because it, people don't want to read and take quizzes and stuff like that. But if they actually experience the concept and then they learn the economy's language so they get the terminology, mm -hmm. then if they're doing battle, then it's okay to do battle by answering a question correctly. Well, Otherwise, it, you know, exactly. what is your favorite color type th thing from Monty Python? Any of you Monty Python fans yeah. know the big test at the bridge, whether they could answer the, the question correctly or the ways they fly off into danger. Um, in doing the research of trying to figure out what past games have been used in education, most of the past games have been simulations used by law enforcement or the military or firefighters or different uh, airplane pilots. So mm -hmm. it's very much hands-on simulation type of learning, which is well suited to those type of to industries. But how do you get a social science to be taught? A social science like economics we figured that it's got to be experiential, but it's also got to have the game mechanics of quests and tech trees and the funny language, etc. And with that, they could be all put together so that they would actually understand the concept and apply the concept 
and be able to pass a standardized te standardized test because they get the language, the terminology. Yeah, the the jargon of what are these official terms that I've you know oligopoly or um, allocation systems. You know, this doesn't come up in everyday conversations, but it's important to to learning economics or business and. That's, you know, every teacher's challenge is like, why do the kids want to learn this stuff? You know, but if we put it into this video game and it's used in the conversations between characters in the game, uh, it becomes much more natural and hopefully more memorable. Yes, it was very interesting. Uh, we have probably 60 iterations of the game to, to try to perfect it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we've had playtesters throughout the world playtesting in different languages and different countries. And, and it's really interesting to watch the videos of them playing it because they come across these terms and they're, they're struggling of how to pronounce the term and, and uh, what these terms mean. And they're, they're just like, who in their right mind would create a word, word like oligopoly or monopsony, you know? Yeah, monopsony, <laughs> But that's that what we use that. in the economic profession. Yeah. And, and uh, so it's kind of a good all together put together because you're enjoying the gameplay, you're experiencing the concept, you're getting learning what the actual concept is and then you're learning the, the jargon and the terminology for it. So it's all one big piece that is fun to play and enjoyable. And then mm. you can pass a college level exam because of it. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I agree. And maybe we should just touch on the, the intro to the story. Um, it's an Amazonian uh, woman from an indigenous tribe in the Amazon rainforest whose village is being encroached upon by illegal loggers. Uh, a problem in Brazil and the Amazon rainforest of uh, deforestation. And our uh, another main character, Mother Planet, swo swoops her up from the Amazon and brings her to Fififer Island, where she's going to learn the tools necessary to defeat the illegal loggers, to stop the illegal loggers. And it's up for the player to progress through and to learn how to do that. And I, I'm really happy with the story, how it does arc and it, it finishes up nicely um, and should be satisfying for the players. Yeah, it was fun when we we're first designing the game because I'm not a story type gamer. I'm more into building and simulations and strategy, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But Chris is really into the storyline of, you know, storyline of games. Yeah. And with Chris, as well as some of our, our other brilliant uh, team, our we built a really yeah. good, <laughs> really good storyline. And what's really nice is it's not just about economics, it's about ecology and how economics can actually solve personal problems, her personal problem that she has, as well as her village problems and ultimately the earth's problems. And so um, it, it ties in nicely to the bigger picture, the bigger world. It's more than just self-interest and what ec economics can teach you. It's also about how economics can deal with problems around the world. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why we think this would be great for anybody 10 years old and older. Um, if they're up for, depending on their English level and uh, where they are in their, in their learning, certainly for an econ, a high school econ class or an introductory to econ at the college level, uh, be fun, a different way for somebody to learn these terms. Um, and we're really, uh, you know, trying to to reach this uh, target audience. Uh, and that's been the challenge. And we're finding that out, you know, we're an indie game dev team. We're learning as we go, we're juggling a lot. And we're, for me, it's, yeah, as the marketing director for this game, I see it as a continual push every day, just keeping the, the content, the original content and the connections happening and occurring and you know eventually word of mouth and persistence will get our our niche game FIFA for Island a game that teaches econ and financial literacy uh, more well known and to fit our target uh, our target audience as well yeah and I'm seeing from the play testers and other people that have been playing the game that they're just playing it for the fun of it mm -hmm. and so it you know, it's one thing if it's like a teacher's assignment and they're like, oh, I got a teacher's assignment. It's homework kind of thing, or I got to do this. But then when they are actually playing it, they're like, oh, this is fun and interesting. And so much so that they don't need a teacher to tell them to play it. If, if you just go out and play it, I mean, anybody listening to this, just go out and play it and see if you actually enjoy it. And if that's the case, then 
that's wonderful because then uh, the game can stand on its own and it can be used in the classroom to assist the, the teacher and to really ingrain concepts and it also can be standalone and played by somebody. So. Yeah, certainly, uh, absolutely. Our uh, strategy right now, we have the game for PC download on Steam. It's $9.99. Uh, we also have a demo available free of charge. Can Anybody can play from a Chrome browser um, on their computer or Android phone. You can play our demo on, on itch. And we look forward to hopefully getting it on Macs soon. We are looking into the technical side of that. Um, I, I just want to take this time to kind of uh, praise my dad a little bit for taking on all this technical side of things. Uh, he's uh, you're very skilled at look, keeping an eye on the, the, the little things, the details, something that I'm not very good at. And I think you could talk maybe a little bit to trying to implement this on the Mac of how detail oriented it is. And it's like one thing, one little bug can mess everything up and it can be so disheartening and challenging. And you had this with making this game as well because you were our main developer and you learned so much. I think that you know this RPG Maker engine so well now and it should be a lot easier as we make our second game. Yeah, and thanks to Chris. I mean, we wouldn't have gotten off the ground without Chris because he was the impetus. Now he's the marketing manager. But uh, at the beginning, he was design, storyline, managing people, et cetera. Um, we also have some great master educators that teach high school that are the best of the best high school teachers. They brought teams to the nationals many times over. They've won awards for being the best teachers. And they provided a lot of great insight of which particular concepts uh, students are, it's hard to grasp by students and really helping us with ways to, uh, re to reach that, that area. Um, in terms of getting the different uh, platforms to available, when we designed it initially, unfortunately, all we fo focused on was PC. And that's kind of me because I'm old school and that's kind of how I played was through PCs, but the world has changed. <laughs> and so the, uh, the next iteration, which we're gonna have another world problem and another individual facing that world problem and getting more into trade and supply and demand and that type of thing uh, is me designed for the small screen. So it should be available yeah. on Android and, yeah. and uh, designing the iPhones. With mobile in mind. Um, with, yeah, design with mobile so many, in mind. So many people are. Yeah, um, but hopefully we can get this game transported over into the Apple world uh, in terms of Macs, mm -hmm. as well as um, iPads, the bigger. I pieces. iOS. Yeah, yeah, big iOS. I mean, you have iOS on the small phone. They have iOS it, on, oh, on iPads. iPad and um, iPhones don't use the same operating system? They are the same operating system, iOS. Yeah. Whereas the Macs, the big laptops yeah, or whatever, are Mac operating system. And with the iOS, uh, the screen is a lot larger on an iPad than it is on an iPhone. So I think this game can be ported to the iPad but probably can't work too well on an iPhone. Yeah. And so. um, I, I also want you to just talk a little bit about your experience as an economist. Um, we talk about our master educators who are high school econ teachers, uh, very um, experienced. But you yourself uh, worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis for 15 years? Uh, 20 years at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, previous years I've been in banking industry. Um, financial industry. And you've taught so, econ as well. Yes. So I was an economist at the Fed. I retired from there six years ago when I was 52. And I wrote a book about the Fed. I also was the head of their economic education program at the Minneapolis Fed. And I also was an adjunct faculty member on several area colleges where I taught undergrad and graduate students economics. Um, and, and you've also the, trained your, your, your sons to view the world in this <laughs> economic uh, viewpoint. I mean, I can't tell you all the times I remember hearing the word opportunity cost and the benefits and costs of every decision I could make as a, as a uh, kid or a teenager. And, you know, largely you let me make the decisions, but you made sure that I knew what was the marginal benefit and what was the marginal cost of uh, these 
these decisions. <laughs> yeah, so I warped my kids. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I've done a lot of economics. I was the president of the Minnesota Economic Association. I'm on the board of the Minnesota Council of Economic Education. Uh, so it's been a really light, lifetime specialty kind of area of mine. And when I was teaching economics uh, at the college level and the graduate level, no matter how hard I tried, there would still be like one or two students out of the class that just didn't groove with my personality, didn't groove, groove with my style. And I really tried to be upfront about it and say, hey, there's going to be somebody out there that just doesn't get my style or whatever. They should probably go with a different professor. Every professor I talk with, they say there's just, they can't reach everybody. And that's why it's kind of important to have many different forms of uh, presentations of education. And that's why I think the game, it might not appeal to everybody, but there's probably a, a, a certain niche that they just love it and can groove on it. And because yeah. of that, uh, they get it better than they would have in the classroom. Certainly, um, it's, it's definitely a, a, an excellent supplementary way to learn this material. And I think every, you know, video game playing is just a growing field. I mean, I grew up playing video games. I still play video games. You grew up playing video games, even older video games, and you're still playing video games. It's, it's something that once you get in the habit of playing video games, you don't really leave that habit. Uh, you can always find some casual downtime to play or maybe more than that. And that's why uh, for, you know, kids, students these days, they, they need to be, we, we need to go to where the students are to, to teach them, to engage with them. And for me, I feel that's social media and video games. And uh, that's why I'm really excited about the project that we're working on, the game studio that we've developed here. Yeah. Now, uh, some teachers in the classroom are going to be benefit from this greatly because there are going to be some students that they, you know, they're forced upon them. They're, they just get whatever students come to their assigned to their class that just aren't going to get it the way that they teach, even though they try to teach to the different learning styles. Um, but this is an added um, piece that can help maybe the students that you can't reach or even the, the students that you can reach, they get a, a bigger, deeper appreciation of the of it. Yeah, excellent. Well, I think we've covered a lot in this podcast. I uh, really thank you for being on, and I hope that we do another iteration of this maybe a month from now. And uh, Yeah, me too. It's very enjoyable. Uh, sorry if I wasn't polished and all this. This is my real big first oh, I'll give you some pointers podcast. after this, Dad. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I've got to look at the camera rather than look at myself. And uh, <laughs> and don't have my and, little hand here. And shaking, shaking the table that your computer is on is not a good idea either. <laughs> <laughs> So we might need to redo a lot of this. Um, yeah. Is, it, is there anything uh, you'd like to add or anything that I forgot to mention? No, but I highly encourage you. We're very proud of this product. It's very educational. It's very fun to play. So I hope you enjoy the story. I hope you enjoy the gameplay. Yeah, please check out our, our links, the Steam page. It's available for, for download right now on the PC. You can play the demo on Itch. Uh, we have social media accounts wherever there's social media pretty much. Uh, and this is our third episode for the podcast. So congrats on that. Most people don't make it to episode three. So <laughs> here we go. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Tobias Madden, father. And uh, see you in uh, shortly here. <laughs> as I All right. Off. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening, everyone.